Okay. All right, recording is on. Uh, welcome everybody to BC 311, our course on faith. And uh, we're going to continue from where we paused last week. Let's take a moment to pray and then we'll get started. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this new day in our lives. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the work of your spirit. And God, even today, as we spend time in your word, uh, we pray that everyone in the class are uh, present here and those connected online will be nurtured in your truth, will be nurtured in, uh, in the spirit, will be strengthened. And God, that each one of us will go from faith to faith. We will go from glory to glory in our walk with you. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, good morning. All right, so let me go ahead and share the class notes, uh, lecture notes, so that we could all uh, follow together. Very quickly, last week we covered uh, chapter 9, uh, just talking about uh, what we need to what we need to do to nurture our faith and how do we nurture our faith in God so we I just I'm just going to quickly review take a few minutes to review so we talked about the fact that the apostle Paul when he was writing to the Thessalonians he commended them for their faith for their work of faith and yet he pointed out in first Thessalonians chapter 3 that um, you know, he, he wanted to perfect what was lacking in their faith. So while they had faith, they were working in faith. They still needed to be perfected or matured or grow up in their faith. And so uh, he, we can see that here. And then in his second episode, once again, Second Thessalonians 1, he commends them that their faith is growing exceedingly. That's verse 3. So our faith can grow. We, we don't have to stay where we are. So our faith can develop. So how do we do that? We just shared a few thoughts here. First, uh, we nurture our faith with the word of God. Keep feeding yourself with the word of God. Um, you know, Go back to the Bible. Open it. Feed yourself with the word. Uh, meditate in God's word. Sow the seed of God's word in your heart. Secondly, you nurture your faith by being part of a community of faith. That means you be part of a fellowship, a people of faith, that they can encourage you together, be encouraged. And lastly, we said, you know, we nurture our faith with testimonies of faith, to hear testimonies, of the stories of people, what God has done in their lives, and that nurtures our faith. Amen? You all with me? Good morning, everyone. <laughs> still sleepy, still awake. All right, now let's go forward to chapter or lesson number 10. In this lesson, what we want to talk about is how to have strong faith in God. Now, what, how can we develop strong faith in God? Uh, the, uh, I just want to talk about uh, and the way I've broken this lesson down is there are certain foundational truths, truths in the word that we must be established in. That means these are truths that you must be really strong in. And you constantly go back, remind yourself about these truths. So five foundational truths. You need to be strong in that. Don't let anybody shake you. Or tell you otherwise. And then I also want to share four practices, four disciplines, right? What we must do to have strong faith in God, right? So it's like this uh, if, uh, you know, if a, a person wants to have a strong, healthy body, there are two things. One is he has to feed himself properly, you, know? you have to feed yourself. And you have to also exercise, like you do those 
exercise. So you need both, right? You need a good diet and you also need a good ex good exercise plan. So it's like that. Here, yeah, a good diet, foundational truths that you have to have in your life. And we're talking about spiritual things now, spiritual. And then practices, things that you keep doing all the time, the exercise, you practice. Then it makes our faith strong. So let's talk about it today. What are the foundational truths that we must be established in? Number one, we have to be established in the integrity of God's words. That means you and I must settle in our hearts that the Bible is truth. God's word is truth. Right? So John 17, 17, Jesus said, your word is truth truth be established in that thy word is truth that means it's in the bible i believe it i'm not going to doubt it every promise i'm going to believe i'm going to believe this word right uh, god's word is eternal god's word is forever settled and so i am established so we are established in the integrity of God's word. So that's very important, right? Because for, for us to have strong faith, you see, there will be many things that challenge us, situations, you know, all kinds of things will challenge us. Sometimes shake our faith, cause doubts, cause fear, all those things. Where should we go back? We should go back to the word of God. No, the Bible says, this is God's word. God, I am settled in this word because you have spoken it. Right? So be established in the integrity of God's word. Secondly, we must be established in Christ's finished work on the cross. That means you know what Jesus did for you on the cross. You know what the cross is. You know, what did Jesus do on the cross? And be established in that. That is, Jesus finished the work. No questions. No more questions. And we have to be established in the finished work on the cross. So we know Jesus bore my sins. So I'm forgiven. Jesus took my sicknesses. So by his stripes, I have been healed. Jesus became a curse, so I am blessed. Jesus crushed the head of the serpent, so I have authority, I have victory over the enemy. Jesus broke the power of sin, so sin will not have dominion over me. Jesus established a new covenant by his blood, so I am in a covenant with God. Nothing can break that. Right? So you, have, you and I have to be established in the finished work of the cross. It's, it's settled. It's done. Right? And that becomes the basis on which we can exercise faith. That because the work is done. You know, I, we are operating from a place of victory. The work is done. So we're coming from that. So we are not trying to achieve victory. We are not trying to gain victory. The victory was obtained for us through Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Right? But we have to be established in the finished work. And we operate from that. We operate on the basis of the finished work. You know, why, can we, why is it that when we see sickness, we can say, you can receive a healing because of the cross? Because by his stripes we were healed. Why is it that when some sinner comes, we can say, you can be forgiven. Because Jesus paid for the sins. Right? That's how we can tell him. With all assurance. We don't have to say, well, let me pray and see if it is God's will for you to be forgiven. There's no more need for prayer. Because it's already done. Right? I, I, we don't have to pray and see, is it God's will for you to have your sins forgiven? No. Because on the cross, it is already paid for. It's over. Now, if somebody comes uh, in bondage to sin or some other problem, we don't have to say, let me pray and see if it is God's will to, for you to be delivered. 
that will be foolishness. Hey, deliverance already finished on the work was finished on the cross. Satan was already defeated on the cross. So now it is a matter of ministering that victory for that person into that person's life. Uh, the devil is an oppressor. He violates, he goes against, you know, what God has provided. And so we operate on that basis. No questions, no doubts. The work has been finished. And we are here to enforce uh, the finished work of Christ on the cross in our own lives and as we minister to other people. Number three, we must be established in our identity in Christ. So you and I, we need to know for sure who we are in Christ. Know your identity. This is who I am in Christ. And what God has said about you in Christ is truth. That's why we have a whole course, a full course on our identity in Christ, who we are in Christ. You're, you're learning that. Right? So whole entire course. But because that is very important. You need to be established. And I think in your second year, you'll have an entire course on the cross. One full course, one full semester studying about the cross, a covenant's cross and blood, uh, trying to understand what Jesus did for us on the cross. Because it's very important. That is the basis for what we do. Right? So being established in the integrity of God's word, being established in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, and being established in your identity. You know, James Put, uh, it's not there here in the notes, but I'm just referencing it. James says, don't be a forgetful hearer. Hmm? If you're a forgetful hearer, that means you forget what the word says. He says, it's like a man who looks in the mirror and then he forgets what, what he looked like. He forgets his own identity. He looks in the mirror and then he goes, he forgets Oh. This is my what I look like. He forgets. So a believer who forgets the word of God is a forgetful hearer. He forgets his own identity. This is who I am in God. This is who I am in Christ. But we must be established in our identity in this is who I really am. That's why many times we keep repeating the statement, who you are in Christ is who you really are. Who you are in Christ is who you really are. So you operate out of that. And somebody comes and says, Aap kon hai? Who are you? And you'll say, like, I'm so-and-so's son, so-and-so's daughter. May this from here that I studied this, I studied it. Or everything about our identity is usually based on some natural things. But really, your identity is based on who you are in Christ. Now, who are you? I'm a son and a daughter of God. I'm part of God's family. God is my father. Jesus is my elder brother. The Holy Spirit is my comforter. He's my strengthener. I am the righteousness of God. I've been justified by faith. I have peace with God. I am more than a conqueror. I'm seated with Jesus in the heavenly places on the Father's right hand, on the highest throne in the universe. Satan is under my feet. All his demons are even lower than him under my feet. That's who I am. That's how we walk. We walk with that sense of confidence and authority. And when we know our identity in Christ, we can at any moment we can just step into faith. Faith is not will not be a problem because you're operating from who you are in Christ. Okay, number four. We have to be established in the reality of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. So you must know the Holy Spirit. Is actually flowing through you. See, in John 7 38, Jesus said, Out of your heart 
spirit. That means out of your innermost person, your spirit will flow rivers of living water. That means out of you. What are those rivers of living water? It's talking about, it's a picture of the flow of the Holy Spirit. The presence and the power of the Holy Spirit flowing out through you. So you, we must be confident. Or we have this assurance in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is flowing through me. There are times I feel His presence. There are times I don't feel His presence. It's okay. He's still flowing. Whether I feel or not doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with feelings. Because this is from the Spirit. It's not from your emotions. Out of your spirit, out of your heart, will flow the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. So you, you're confident, you're, dip, you're, you're assured of the reality of this. So when you speak to people, when you minister to people, you know it's not just you, but the Holy Spirit through you. You're confident about that. Holy Spirit, thank you that you touch people, that you minister to people. Uh, through, my, through my life, I, I, we are just earthen vessels. But the Holy Spirit is flowing. And you're confident. You're established in that. There is no doubt in your mind. Oh, will the Holy Spirit come today? Is he awake today? He hasn't left. He's in you. He is more ready than, than you are. Amen? So, just confident about the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And the fifth truth that we need to be established in is the authority of the name of Jesus. That name, in the name of Jesus. Okay. You see, when Jesus said that you and I can use his name, when he said, Use my name, in my name, like Mark 16, 17, and 18. These signs will follow those who believe, believers, those who believe in Jesus. He's saying, in my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover. So he's saying, those who believe, in my name, they will use the name of Jesus. Now, understand what it means to use the name of Jesus. What does it mean? You know, if, for example, if the chief minister or some important person said, go to those people, and tell them, I sent you. And tell them to do this, this, this. So you'll go very proudly. You'll go, hey, chief minister sent me. <laughs> very proudly, chief minister sent me. And do this, this, this. You're very confident. Why? Because he's backing you up. He sent you. you use, you're using his name. And you know they have to listen. Otherwise, chief minister will get on their case, right? So that's in the natural. But in a much greater way, Jesus said that we who believe in him will use his name. That means you are going in his name. Jesus sent me. I am here. On his behalf, I am standing as when I'm standing here, it's as though he is standing here. And I'm here to do what he would do if he was here present physically. That's what it means. When you say in Jesus' name, it means you're representing him. You're standing there in his place to act on his behalf, to do what he would do 
if he was standing there himself. It is as good as Jesus standing there when you and I say, in Jesus' name. But then we have to have faith. Have faith in that name. So you and I are convinced. Hey, I am here in the name of Jesus. When I use the name of Jesus, it's as good as Jesus standing here. And I'm expecting those same results. I'm expecting Jesus to do this work. Because he said, anything you ask in my name, I will do it. Or anything you command in my name, anything you demand in my name, anything you uh, decree in my name, Jesus will do it. He will do it. Right. So this is very, very important to be established in the authority of the of, of the name of Jesus. Now, think about this. You know, after his resurrection, Jesus said, "All authority." All authority in heaven and on earth is given to Jesus. That means Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. But on earth, that all authority has been vested or is being exercised or is being expressed through the believers because Jesus is physically in heaven. Physi uh, Jesus is in heaven. Or I shouldn't say it's physically <laughs> God of spirits, but what I mean is he has ascended and is seated at the Father's right hand. He is in heaven. But on earth, physically, it's the believer. And when the believer says, in Jesus' name, that name carries all authority. All authority. That name. There's no greater authority than that name. It's all authority. So that's how, that's what it is to use the name of Jesus. So we need to have faith in that. Now, sadly, sometimes believers use the name of Jesus as, you know, some magic. It didn't, they don't understand the spiritual significance. They're not looking at the fact that the name of Jesus has all the, it's more like a magic. Maybe it will work. If it doesn't work, Okay, doesn't matter. Like that. No. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Now, if you if use the name of Jesus as though it was like a, a good luck charm, some magic thing, eh, no. It's not gonna, we're not going to see any results. But when we use it or when we speak it because we believe in Jesus Christ, who He is, what His name carries, then we are going to see results. Amen. So these are the five things that as a believer, we must be established. Five truths. Right? First, the integrity of the word of God. Second, the finished work of Christ on the cross. Third, our identity in Christ. Fourth, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And fifth, the authority of the name of Jesus. You, you have to be so settled in this truth. And then keep nurturing yourself. Because don't forget. See, we all tend to forget. Ah, I, I, I did it in first semester. <laughs> first semester course. I, but the purpose is not to do a course. That's not why you're here. You're here to be established in the truth. So it's not about finishing one course on the Holy Spirit, one course on the name of Jesus, uh, 
and the authority of the believer one course on you know uh, identity and oh i finished the course yeah you finished the course but the purpose of the course is not for you to finish the course the purpose of the course is for you to be established in that truth and for you to live by that truth the rest of your life that's the purpose. That's why we are teaching you these things, right? We're not teaching you these things so you finish the course. That's, that's not the point. We are teaching you these things because you have to live by this the rest of your life. You have to live. So you can't say, oh, I did first semester course on faith. Finished. Forget about faith. Hey, you can't forget about faith. <laughs> you have to live by faith forever as long as you're on earth. Once you get to heaven, you can forget about faith, you'll see everything. <laughs> but as long as we are on the earth, we have to live by faith. So whatever you're learning now has to stay with you for the rest of your life. It has to be with you. All these truths. Because they uh, make up the foundation for strong faith. Our identity in Christ. Uh, the integrity of the Word of God, uh, the, f the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, um, the, the finished work of Christ on the cross, and um, the, the name of Jesus. Okay, these are very important. So, you're going to be established in this over and over again. And then, okay, let me just pause here, see if there are any questions um, from online students. All right. Any questions from anyone online in our class today? Any questions? Everybody okay? All right. I was just looking at the chat. Uh, no questions? Fine. I'm going to go forward. All right. Let's move on. Okay, so the first five things, what we saw, I like our diet. You have to keep on feeding yourself. This is your our spiritual diet. Keep on feeding yourself these five things. The integrity of God's word, the finished work of Christ on the cross, um, your identity in Christ, the work of the spirit, the authority of Jesus' name. You have to keep going, feeding it. Listen, uh, you know, go back to the Bible. And that's why we put all this as good as books, so it's easy for you. You know, you can take the book. Uh, we will get all these books printed. Uh, we are just resuming printing, so hopefully, uh, these books will all be come out in print. We'll have these copies, so you can see. You know, a book on uh, the name of Jesus. It's easy. You can just go through all the scriptures and feed yourself with the scriptures. Right? Feed yourself. So that's one side. That's your diet. But then exercise. What are the practices? Spiritually, what are the disciplines? What are the practices right? that will help develop strong faith? Number one is always declare God's word. Now, the word, uh, we will talk more about this later on, but I'm just mentioning this here in Hebrews 10.23. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says, let us hold fast, hold firmly with a firm grip. You know, don't give up. The confession of our hope, or that word uh, can also mean confidence or faith. So you are confessing. The word confess means to speak, to declare. It's something you say okay? in agreement. So the confession of your expectation the confession of your confidence, of your faith, without wavering. Don't waver. Don't, sometimes there, sometimes, you know, sometimes, yeah, no, don't waver. Firm. Hold fast to the confession of your faith. Because, sorry, without wavering, for he who promised is 
faith. Don't waver because he who promised is faithful. God who promised is faithful. So don't waver. Don't waver. Hold firm to the confession of your faith. So, at all times, when you speak, the word confession means to say, to declare. When you speak, speak your faith. Right? Now, I'm not saying that means you don't say that there is a problem. If there's a problem, hey, yeah, there is a problem. You know, if there's not enough light, you say, hey, I need some light. Uh, you know, whatever. Whatever. You, while, while you recognize the situation, you recognize what is you know, there is a problem, whatever. Over and above that, I know there is a problem, but I know what God has said. My faith is not in the problem. It is in the promise. It's in what God has said. So that's what I'm going to speak against the problem, against that situation, against that trouble, against that challenge, against that need. So, so when we say, you know, uh, always declare God's word, I'm not saying don't recognize a problem, a situation, you know, that, yeah, it is there. But having understood that there is a problem or situation, what do we do? We speak God's word to the problem, over the problem into the problem so the problem you're not the final word god's word is the final word my faith is in the word of god so i will declare god's word over and above the problem right so this practice will help you walk in strong faith so you have to do this so the bible says Hold fast. So if you're holding to it tightly, that means there's never a time you're giving up. There's never a time. All the time, you're holding fast to the confession of your faith without wavering. Because he who promised is faithful. So holding fast. Holding fast also means it is an intentional thing. It's an intention. You're purposely holding tight. Holding fast also means sometimes it's going to require some effort. You know, it's going to require. I'm determined to hold fast to this promise. Because the one who made the promise is faithful. There's no problem. He was not, he will not fail his promise. So I'm going to hold on to it tightly. Problems will come and go. Difficulties will come and go. Challenges will come and go. Situations will come and go. I hold fast to the promise. God said. Amen? So that's important. And we're going to talk about these things, how to do it. I'm just giving us the outline. Number two. For us to... Have strong faith. It's always important to keep a clear conscience. To keep a clear conscience. It means that there should be nothing in our heart that is condemning us. Because if our heart condemns us, 1 John 3.21 says, we cannot have confidence in God. That means we can't have Confidence before God, we cannot have confidence. In, our, our confidence in God is going to be weak. So I, there should not be anything in my heart that's condemning me. Oh, I says, you know, you did this, you did that. You, you know, if, if my conscience is not clear, then I cannot have confidence. Right? And so that's connected. Next verse talks about receiving from him. Whatever we ask, receive from him because we keep his commandments. So in order for me to have a heart that does not condemn me, I must keep his commandments. Then I can have a clear conscience. 
must do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Right? So, if we make mistakes, if we do something wrong, immediately you say, God, I'm sorry. And don't let it stay. Don't let it stay. God, I'm sorry. I should not have said that. I should not have done that. That attitude was not right, God. That way I spoke was not right. Uh, or whatever, you know, it could be may sin in thought, word, or deed. But God, that is not right. It's not. Forgive me, God. So you keep a clear conscience. Only then you can have confidence in God. Okay? So be very quick. See, we will make mistakes, but be very quick to deal with it. And we, have, we saw earlier in 1 Timothy 1.19 that uh, a good conscience is needed to maintain faith. A good conscience is needed to maintain faith. Number three, how do we, what practice must we have to develop strong faith? Number three is always exercise your faith. So faith is like a muscle, like we said earlier. Uh, you have to keep exercising it, keep using it. Then it will become stronger and stronger. Keep using it. Keep exercising. You, anything you go, you face. Your reaction must be okay. I'm going to deal with this by faith. Okay, I, I will also do whatever I need to do in the natural to make sure you know I am living properly. That's true. But I also want to address it by faith so in every situation our response must be i will handle this by faith and of course i will live responsibly don't don't be foolish so so always exercise your faith and that's important because the more you exercise your faith the stronger your faith will become number 4 Always be motivated by love. Always be motivated by love. Love is very powerful. So you have to look into your heart. Why do I want to do something? If I'm motivated by love, great, because faith works through love. We saw that Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Faith works through. So if you're motivated by love, great. But if we are motivated by pride, by jealousy, by self, by you know other, other, other wrong motivations, faith will not work. Faith will not produce. So faith works through love. So always be motivated. What's motivating me? If it's the love of God, go for it. Faith will work. Because faith works through love. Okay. So, what did we say? For us to have strong faith, just quickly review this lesson before our break. For strong faith, be established in these five important foundational truths and maintain these four practices. Speak your faith. Act your faith, keep a clear conscience, always walk in love. Hmm? Speak your faith, act your faith all the time. Keep a clear conscience and always operate in love. Then you and I have, you know, we can develop a strong faith. Strong. Okay, let's let me just check. Any questions from our online students? All right, let's see now. Joel Jackson Joel has a question. Um, sometimes, even when I keep speaking God's word in faith, the problem keeps persisting at times, it even increases from. Uh, even unexpected sights. I'm caught unaware. 
I get discouraged and tried at times uh, if I'm going in the right direction. All right, Churchill, I understand. See, um, so what Judge and, uh, Joel is sharing is sometimes we keep speaking the word of God and we don't see any immediate change in the situation, in the matter. Sometimes it might be even getting worse. Or sometimes more problems are coming on the same thing from other sides, which we didn't expect. So what should we do? Uh, I'd say sometimes it is, I'm, 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 I'm getting uh, discouraged and uh, sometimes tired um, whether you know whether you're going in the right direction now so this is where we have to learn to have faith through time this is called the endurance of we will have we have a separate lesson on that but hebrews chapter 6 and verse 12 says do not uh, i'll just use a different word lazy or do not give up but follow those who through faith and endurance inherit the promise so hebrews 6:12 Follow those who through faith and endurance inherit the promise. So how do you inherit the promise? We must have faith and endurance. Okay, another scripture, Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, Judson, I'm answering a question. I'm speaking to people here, but I'm answering a question. Hebrews 10 verse 35, another scripture. The writer of Hebrews says, Do not cast away your confidence because you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Notice what he's saying. Don't lose your confidence. Hebrews 10.35 Because you need some patience. You need some endurance. After you've done the will of God. That means what you're doing is the will of God, but you need patience in order to receive the promise. So, the what I would encourage you, Justin, is along with faith, we need endurance or patience. Right? Hebrews 6.12 Hebrews 10.35, you need endurance. And it is through that endurance that even after we do the will of God, we are going to receive the promise. Now you say, but why do I need endurance? I wish everything was easy. Press the switch, light comes on. <laughs> because the Bible says, endurance produces character. And that's Romans chapter 5. Verses 3 and 4. Endurance produces character. Why is endurance important? That's how character comes. Through endurance. So, in our journey of faith, God wants us to receive the promise, but He also wants us to develop so the double benefit. You get the promise, you also have character built. So that's the journey we are making, right? So we don't give up. So don't give up, Virgin. Do what you have to do. Now, sometimes you may also want to consider if there are any, is there anything practical that you need to do? Like some practical steps um, uh, concerning that matter. Um, you can think about it and, you know, uh, if there are practical things you need to do, you can work on that as well. All right. Um, let's see now. There's another question from Chaya. When we hold on to 
promise of God with hope and faith and don't give up those times we had to face people who are also believers and discourage us by telling us fool and our faith they think foolishness how to deal with this situation okay so so Chaya is Chaya Paul is asking is, is asking a question that see when you're walking by faith there may be people who uh, say you're foolish you're not doing what is right and all of that uh, how do you how do you uh, deal with that situation so what I would say is one is we listen to these people to see if there is any uh, useful thing that they are telling us right so we don't want to cut people off from our lives uh, because sometimes people could be telling us things that will help us so we have to listen to people uh, so you listen to them saying are they telling me something that is right. Maybe they're telling me something that I need to correct myself in. And if they're giving something useful, then we need to take it and we need to uh, accept it and you know make whatever changes. But if they are saying things that have no merit, that are that are not really helping us, but are actually opposite to the word of God, opposite to what God has spoken to us. That's when we need to, um, let me use the word, you know, cut off what they are saying. Uh, I'm just thinking of a couple of scriptures here. Proverbs, let me give you the exact verse. Um, Proverbs, I think it's 19. Let me get there. Um, I can remember the verse, I just can't remember the reference. Um, the verse says, Seize my son to hear the instruction that call okay, Proverbs 19 27. Proverbs 19 27. I'm, I'm, I'm reading from the King James. It says, Seize listening to instruction, my son, or that will. And you will stray from the words of knowledge. So, uh, the, what it is saying is, if we don't listen to instruction, the right instruction, we will wander away. We will uh, go away from the right, from the truth, from the words of knowledge. So, we must listen. We must listen to instruction so that we can stay in the right path. We can walk in the right path. But at the same time, we have to be careful what we hear and how we hear. You know, many times Jesus in his ministry, he said, be careful how you hear or what you listen to. This is in Mark chapter 4. Um, let me give you the exact verse. Mark chapter 4. Mark 4, 24. Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you hear more will be given so saying you know pay close attention to what you're listening and uh, how you listen to so words are important uh, you have to treat them based on the merit of what is being said if it's good instruction receive it if it's instruction that is causing us to go away from the words of knowledge then we reject that instruction all right uh, so it really depends on what is being said and who's saying it if it's a discouragement to our faith then of course, reject it. If it's contrary to the word of God, reject it. If it's contrary to the faith, the, uh, to, to your faith, then reject it. But if it is giving you some wisdom, if it is giving you some guidance, uh, if it's opening you up to do some something better, then of course, receive it and you know make whatever changes. Okay, so I hope that was helpful. I, uh, we will take a break now. I will come back. We'll answer... Uh, Krisha's uh, question. We'll also take any questions from the class, and uh, we will we will do that. Okay, so let's go for a break. We'll be back in ten minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 